On this channel, we like to celebrate the weird and wonderful. We like to find things that make you stop in your tracks and take a second look, and tell you about their strange stories. We love charming curiosities and unexplained artifacts. This video is absolutely packed full of them. They're things that can't be categorized any other way than by calling them some of the most amazing and unusual things you'll ever see. Thankfully, we live in an age when grave robbing is mostly unheard of. When your time on this planet is over and you're laid down to rest, you can usually be assured that your rest will be eternal and undisturbed. That hasn't always been the case. During the 19th century, grave robberies were surprisingly common, and understandably, people began to fear for their safety of the remains of their loved ones. That's why somebody invented coffin torpedoes. Philip K. Clover, an artist from Columbus, Ohio, filed his first patent for a coffin torpedo in 1878. It was a simple invention. If someone prized open the lid of a casket, the force of the lid opening would detonate a small torpedo full of lead pellets, and the would-be grave robber would soon be needing a casket of their own. Thomas N. Howell patented a more advanced version of the same device in 1881. His worked more like a pressure-sensitive landmine. The market for black market cadavers died out around 1913, putting this bizarre practice to an end. For a while in the Victorian era, you were more likely to be photographed after you died than when you were alive. Unlike today, when cameras are with us at all times because of mobile phones, photography was rare and very expensive. That meant that photography was reserved for very special occasions, including getting one last family portrait together after a loved one had passed away. Often, the deceased would be propped up by a stand to give them the appearance of being alive, and may even have had their eyes open. By modern standards, this would be considered ghoulish and more than a little creepy. But at the time, pictures like these would bring comfort to the grieving family of the recently departed. While some of the alleged post-mortem photographs that began to do the rounds on the internet in 2014 have been proven to be fakes, it's known that the somewhat macabre practice did go on for a while, and only came to an end when cameras and photography became less prohibitively expensive, meaning that families had plenty of pictures of their still-alive loved ones to remember them by. Hunting for bears is a hazardous pursuit. They're very dangerous animals when they're angered or made to feel threatened, and they don't give up the fight easily if their lives are in danger. That's why the bear hunters of the 1800s in Siberia took every possible precaution when they went out on the hunt. That meant putting on suits that made them look like strange human cacti. These outfits might look like something from a low-budget horror movie. They're actually primitive but practical forms of body armor, consisting of two layers of leather held together with inch-long iron nails. They still wouldn't guarantee your safety if a bear set on you with the intention of doing you harm, but the nails might be enough to make the bear think twice about taking a second swing at you after impaling their paws on the first attempt. The wearer could also be quietly confident that a bear wouldn't be able to bite them or eat them. That being said, though, some people feel that anyone who goes hunting for bears deserves everything that they get in return from the animals. If you're an avid video gamer, you might look at this bizarre outfit and think it comes from a promotional image from the latest Fallout game. As suitable as it appears to be for post-apocalyptic fashion, though, it's not a radiation suit. It is, however, an item of clothing that was intended to keep its wearer safe. Known as Wanahera, which loosely translates as Old Gentleman, it's a diving suit from the 1720s donated to a museum in Rahe, Finland in 1860. Apparently, it was once in the personal possession of a man known only as Captain Lefstadi. It's not the most elegant suit you'll ever see, but it achieved its aim of being waterproof. The suit is made of cow leather, with the seams sewn tight with a waxy thread, and then sealed with resin and coated in pork fat. The wearer was able to breathe thanks to a wooden tube that poked out of the top, Obviously, that meant it wasn't suitable for deep dives, and it was incredibly heavy. 
It was also far from maneuverable. The purpose of suits like these was to allow ship's captain to go below the waterline and inspect the hull of their vessel while in dry dock. Being a street musician in medieval Germany was a job reserved only for the brave. While people appreciated musical accompaniment while they were out walking the streets, they hated nothing more than poor musicianship. If you were deemed to be a poor musician, you faced a cruel and unusual punishment. Attached by force to a Schandflöte, or to give it its name in English, a shame flute. Made of particularly heavy iron, the flute would be shackled around the neck of the offending musician, and their fingers would be screwed to the body of the flute so they couldn't take it off or put it down. As if that weren't enough, the wearer of the shame flute would then be forcibly marched through the streets of the town or city where they'd committed their offense, and their peers would belt them with rotting fruit and vegetables. Only when an official declared that the musician had suffered enough would they be freed. The punishment often went on for hours. We suppose that's one way to encourage people to learn their instruments properly. Returning to the theme of the people of the Victorian era in the United Kingdom and their strange funerary traditions, here's another oddity that you may have seen during funerals. It's known as a lacrimatory bottle, or to give it its colloquial name, a tear catcher. Some myths and rumors say that similar devices were used by the ancients of Greece, Rome, and Italy. But Victorian Britain is the only place and time direct evidence of their use has been recorded. It was once believed that people collected their tears in these bottles during funerals, and when the tears had evaporated, the period of mourning could officially come to an end. Similar vessels have been collected from ancient tombs all over the world and been mistaken for tear catchers, but they were more likely used to hold perfume. Some anecdotal evidence suggests that the practice may have extended to America, where the widows of Civil War casualties would use the tear catchers during the funerals of their husbands. But solid evidence of this is hard to come by. What did you do in the 19th century if you were concerned that the grave of your loved one might be attacked by grave robbers, but you couldn't quite stomach the idea of blowing the attacker up using a coffin torpedo? The answer to that question is that you might invest in a mort safe a cage that goes over the burial space of the deceased and prevents anyone from even getting close to it. It's thought that the first ever mort safe was invented in 1816 in Scotland, a country that was particularly appalled by the concept of grave robbing because of a widespread belief in the resurrection. A mort safe was usually rented rather than bought outright. It would be placed over a grave for around six weeks after burial and then removed to be rented out again and used elsewhere. After six weeks, it was generally accepted that the decomposition process rendered the cadaver of the grave's occupant useless to grave robbers. Very few examples of the devices have survived to the present day, but there's still one in excellent condition in Greyfriars Kirkyard, Edinburgh. In 2020, flea infestations are mostly a problem for cats, dogs, and other household pets. In the 18th century, they were very much a problem for humans, too. Hygiene and washing standards back then left a lot to be desired, so it was reasonably common for people, and women in particular, to find fleas in their hair, wigs, clothes, and beds. Bathing regularly could only do so much after the fleas had set up home in a wig or a dress, and so a more effective solution had to be found. That solution came in the shape of the kind of flea traps that were designed by German doctor Franz Ernst Bruckmann in around 1710. A flea trap was a hollow shell, usually cylindrical or egg-shaped and made of wood, ivory, or silver. Inside the shell, the wearer would place a scrap of material soaked with drops of blood to attract fleas, and the device would then be hung around their neck like a pendant. The blood-hungry fleas would crawl in and get stuck to the fat or honey resin that coated the inside of the flea trap. It probably smelled awful, but it was better than being covered in fleas. All of us live with the knowledge that our time on Earth will eventually come to an end. When it does, we hope to bow out gracefully and with dignity. Unfortunately, due to a badly mistaken medical belief, dignity was hard to come by for some people during the 17th and 18th centuries. No sooner had they taken their final breath 
their heartbroken loved ones would give them a tobacco smoke enema in the hope of reviving them. The process is exactly what it sounds like. The use of a bellows-like device, like the one we can see here to blow tobacco smoke into the rectal cavity of the very sick or recently deceased in the hope that it would stimulate respiration. It's thought that the practice was first identified among Native Americans before being brought back to Europe from the New World and becoming an accepted form of medicine. At one point, London's Royal Humane Society provided several such respiration kits along the banks of the River Thames so that they could be used to revive people who had fallen in and drowned. There are even some stories of the devices being used successfully, and so it wasn't until nicotine was proven to be harmful in the early 19th century that the practice was abandoned. Most people are familiar with the idea of a beauty mask, the kind of face mask you might wear overnight to improve your complexion or smooth out wrinkles or crow's feet. It isn't a new idea. In fact, it's been around for almost 150 years. When Helen Rowley first came up with the concept in 1875, she tried to sell it under the name of the toilet mask. The name didn't catch on, so she rebranded it the face glove and had a little more success. Helen's ideas of what would improve someone's appearance were a little bit odd. Her mask, made of Indian rubber and designed to be worn three nights a week, was filled with bleaches and salves designed to make the wearer sweat profusely. Her logic was that sweat would open up and relieve the pores and also improve circulation. Based on illustrations, it looks like something from a nightmare, the kind of mask that Hannibal Lecter was forced to wear to stop him from eating people in the Silence of the Lambs. As people don't still wear face gloves now, we can only assume that they didn't have a great success rate when it came to clearing up acne. Taxidermy has always been a divisive subject. Some people think it's a neat way of preserving wild animals for study, and others just find the whole idea a little grisly. If you're in the second camp, we apologize for what you're about to see. Here are some examples of the curious work of Victorian taxidermist Walter Potter, who was known for the strange scenes he created with his animal cadavers. How about this delightful scene of kittens playing croquet in a tiny parlor? or a school classroom where all the students are little rabbits. He even made a whole wedding scene featuring a pair of lifeless cats exchanging their vows at the altar, watched by a parade of impeccably well-dressed kitten onlookers. The activities of Potter's post-taxidermy squirrels are a little less salubrious. They're in a speakeasy, smoking cigars and playing poker. All of the animals are held together by wires and stuffed with sawdust. It's definitely a form of art, although not one that's to everyone's liking. In the late 19th century, electricity was still a new and exciting idea. It was most commonly being used to provide illumination, but people were excited about what other potential uses this newfound source of power might have. According to the inventors of the Heidelberg electric belt, electricity could be used to cure just about anything. You can think of this device as a form of jock strap that gave the wearer mild electric shocks. Instead of being used as a form of torture, though, it was supposed to treat everything from impotence to insomnia, including rheumatism, depression, back pain, poor circulation, fatigue, and kidney disease. All you had to do was strap the device to yourself, switch on the power, and let the voltage jolt you back to full working order. It appears that the device was briefly available as a mail-order curiosity and never caught on as a popular medical garment. While we don't have any record of such a device electrocuting its owner, there's also nothing to suggest one of them ever worked for its intended purpose. Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and enjoy watching new videos on my channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon!